Section 8. Europe and the Faith. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Europe and the Faith by Hilaire Belloc. Section 8. Chapter 2. Continued. If he were like most of his kind in that generation, the Catholic Church would have affected him as an irritant. Its existence interfered with the general routine of public affairs. If he were, as a small minority, even of the rich already were, in sympathy with it, though not of it, it would still have concerned him. It was the only exceptional organism of his uniform time, and it was growing. This senator goes into the Curia, he deals with the business of the day. It includes complaining upon certain assessments of the imperial taxes. He consults the lists and sees there, it was the fundamental conception of the whole of that society, men drawn up in grades of importance exactly corresponding to the amount of freehold land which each possessed. He has to vote, perhaps upon some question of local repairs, the making of some new street, or the establishment of some monument. Probably he hears of some local quarrel, provoked, he is told, by the small segregated Christian body, and he follows the police to report upon it. He leaves the curia for his own business, and hears at home the accounts of his many farms. What deaths of slaves there have been, what has been the result of harvest, what purchases of slaves or goods have been made, what difficulty there has been in recruiting among his tenantry for the army, and so forth. Such a man was concerned one way or another with perhaps a dozen large farming centers or villages, and had some thousands of human beings dependent upon him. In this domestic business he hardly comes across the church at all. It was still in the towns. It was not yet rooted in the countryside. There might possibly, even at that distance from the frontiers, be rumors of some little incursion or other of barbarians. Perhaps a few hundred fighting men, come from the outer Germanies, had taken refuge with a Roman garrison after suffering defeat at the hands of neighboring barbarians, or perhaps they were attempting to live by pillage in the neighborhood of the garrison, and the soldiers had been called out against them. He might have, from the hands of a friend in that garrison, a letter brought to him officially by the imperial post which was organized along all the great highways telling him what had been done to the marauders or to the suppliants how too some had after capture been allotted land to till under conditions nearly servile others perhaps forcibly recruited for the army the news would never for a moment have suggested to him any coming danger to the society in which he lived he would have passed from such affairs to recreations, probably literary, and there would have been an end of his day. In such a day, what we note as most exceptional is the aspect of the small Catholic body in a then pagan city. And we should remember, if we are to understand history, that by this time it was already the phenomena which contemporaries were also beginning to note most carefully. That is a fair presentment of the manner in which a number of local affairs, including the Catholic Church in his city, would have struck such a man at such a time. If we use our knowledge to consider the empire as a whole, we must observe certain other things in the landscape, touching the church and the society around it, which a local view cannot give us. In the first place, there had been in that society from time to time acute spasmodic friction breaking out between the imperial power and this separate voluntary organism the catholic church the church's partial secrecy its high vitality its claim to independent administration were the superficial causes of this speaking as a catholic we know that the ultimate causes were more profound the conflict was a conflict between jesus christ with his great foundation on one hand and what Jesus Christ himself had called the world. But it is unhistorical to think of a pagan world opposed to a Christian world 
at that time. The very conception of a pagan world requires some external manifest Christian civilization against which to contrast it. There was none such, of course, for Rome in the first generation of the third century. The church had around her a society in which education was very widely spread, intellectual curiosity very lively, a society largely skeptical, but interested to discover the right conduct of human life, and tasting now this opinion, now that, to see if it could discover a final solution. It was a society of such individual freedom that it is difficult to speak of its luxury or its cruelty. A cruel man could be cruel in it without suffering the punishment which centuries of Christian training would render natural to our ideas. But a merciful man could be and would be merciful, and would preach mercy, and would be generally applauded. It was a society in which there were many ascetics, whole schools of thought, contemptuous of sensual pleasure, but a society distinguished from the Christian, particularly in this, that at bottom it believed man to be sufficient to himself, and all believed to be mere opinions. Here was the great antithesis between the church and her surroundings. It is an antithesis which has been revived today. Today, outside the Catholic Church, there is no distinction between opinions and faith, nor any idea that man is other than sufficient to himself. The Church did not and does not believe man to be sufficient to himself, nor naturally in possession of those keys which would open the doors to full knowledge or full social content. It proposed and proposes its doctrines to be held not as opinions, but as a body of faith. It differed from, or was more solid than, all around it in this, that a proposed statement, instead of hypotheses, affirmed concrete historical facts, instead of suggesting myths, and treated its ritual of mysteries as realities, instead of symbols. A word is to the constitution of the Church. All men with an historical training know that the Church of the years 200 to 250 was what I have described it, an organized society under bishops, and what is more, it is evident that there was a central primacy at Rome, as well as local primacies in various other great cities. But what is not so generally emphasized is the way in which Christian society appears to have looked at itself at that time. The conception which the Catholic Church had of itself in the early third century can perhaps best be approached by pointing out that if we use the word Christianity we are unhistorical. Christianity is a term in the mouth and upon the pen of the post-Reformation writer. It connotes an opinion or a theory, a point of view, an idea. The Christians of the time of which I speak had no such conception. Upon the contrary, they were attached to its very antithesis. They were attached to the conception of a thing, of an organized body instituted for a definite end, disciplined in a definite way, and remarkable for the possession of definite and concrete doctrine. One can talk, in speaking of the first three centuries, of Stoicism, or Epicureanism, or Neoplatonism, but one cannot talk of Christianism, or Christism. Indeed, no one has been so ignorant or unhistorical as to attempt those phrases. But the current phrase Christianity, used by moderns as identical with the Christian body in the third century, is intellectually the equivalent of Christianism or Christism. And I repeat, it connotes a grossly unhistorical idea. It connotes something historically false, something that never existed. Let me give an example of what I mean. Four men will be sitting as guests of a fifth in a private house in Carthage in the year 225. They are all men of culture, all possessed of the two languages, Greek and Latin, well-read and interested in the problems and half-solutions of their skeptical time. One will profess himself materialist, and will find another to agree with him. There is no personal God. Certain moral duties must be recognized by men for such and such utilitarian reasons 
and so forth. He finds support. The host is not of that opinion. He has been profoundly influenced by certain mysteries into which he has been initiated, that is, symbolical plays showing the fate of the soul, and performed in high seclusion before members of a society sworn to secrecy. He has come to feel the spiritual life as the natural life round him. He has curiously followed, and often paid at high expense, the services of necromancers. He believes that in an initiation, which he experienced in his youth and during the secret and most vivid dramas or mystery in which he then took part, he actually came in contact with the spiritual world. Such men were not uncommon. The declining society of the time was already turning to influences of that type. The host's conviction, his awed and reticent attitude towards such things, impress his guests. One of the guests, however, a simple, solid kind of man, not drawn to such vagaries, says that he has been reading with great interest the literature of the Christians. He is in admiration of the traditional figure of the founder of their church. He quotes certain phrases, especially from the four Orthodox Gospels. They move him to eloquence, and by their poignancy and illuminative power have an effect upon his friends. He ends by saying, for my part I have come to make it a sort of rule to act as this man Christ would have had me act. He seems to me to have led the most perfect life I ever read of, and the practical maxims which are attached to his name seem to me a sufficient guide to life. That, he will conclude simply, is the groove into which I have fallen, and I do not think I shall ever leave it. Let us call the man who has so spoken Ferolius. Would Ferolius have been a Christian? Would the officials of the Roman Empire have called him a Christian? Would he have been in danger of unpopularity where Christians were unpopular? Would Christians have received him among themselves as part of the strict and still somewhat secret society? Would he have counted with any single man of the whole empire as one of the Christian body? The answer is most emphatically no. No Christian in the first three centuries would have held such a man as coming within his view. No imperial officer in the most violent crisis of one of those spasmodic persecutions which the church had to undergo would have troubled him with a single question. No Christian congregation would have regarded him as in any way connected with their body. Opinion of that sort, Christism, had no relation to the church. How far it existed we cannot tell, for it was unimportant. In so far as it existed, it would have been on all fours with any one of the vague opinions which floated about the cultured Roman world. Now it is evident that the term Christianity used as a point of view, a mere mental attitude, would include such a man, and it is equally evident that we have only to imagine him to see that he had nothing to do with the Christian religion of that day. For the Christian religion, then as now, was a thing, not a theory. It was expressed in what I have called an organism, and that organism was the Catholic Church. The end of section eight.